Welcome everyone, my name's Sylph, and this is my attempt to beat a hardcore Nuzlocke of Pokemon Platinum with only Dark-type Pokemon. The full rule set for this run is listed down below, but put simply, only the first Dark-type encounter in each route or area can be caught. If a Pokemon faints, it must be permanently boxed. No items except held items in battle. Party Pokemon levels are limited to the next Gym Leader or Final League member's Ace. And finally, the battle mode must be put on set at all times. A couple months ago, we tried to beat a hardcore Dark-type Nuzlocke of Pokemon Emerald, and we realized how terrible the typing was since it's a special type offensively in those games, yet most of the Pokemon with the type are much better physical attackers. So so today, I wanted to see if there was a substantial improvement with them in Gen 4 when moves themselves got the physical special split. Overall, Gen 4 provides a good selection of fully evolved Dark types, although we of course won't be allowed to use Darkrai as per our No Legendaries or Mythicals rule. Platinum specifically has some really interesting situations with a couple of these encounters, but we'll get into that as the run progresses. This video was made possible by Raid Shadow Legends, a free-to-play game that I've been really getting into lately since there's a lot of crossover with what we do here on the channel. From selecting my own team of champions that matches up against opponents, figuring out the correct moves to make, and battling super challenging bosses, this kind of stuff is exactly what I like in games and what I'm sure you guys will enjoy too. Now we all know one of the most exciting parts of the Pokemon games is what we call the end game or post game with incredibly fun and challenging battle facilities and whatnot, and this in my opinion is what Raid does so super well with what's called the Doom Tower. According to the lore of the game, this tower is basically a giant prison which the Arbiter built to seal off horrible monsters created by Syroth. Now that Syroth is leaking back into the world, the Doom Tower isn't doing its job like it's supposed to, so the Arbiter sends people like you and I to go crack a few heads, and it's quite a challenge. What's amazing is that the Doom Tower is just one of the numerous avenues of content you can pursue in the game, whether you want to tackle the campaign, take on dungeons, or test your team of champions against others in PvP arena battles. This is what I love about Raid. There's an endless array of content and there's always new ways to formulate a better team for what you're facing and upgrade your champions accordingly. This month, Raid's also got a non-stop schedule of special events and activities, including a jam-packed Halloween lineup with big rewards and special fragment events to get some brand new legendary champions, including one very spooky champion that I'm quite fond of personally. If you want a massive head start in the game, hit the link in the description or scan the QR code on screen. New players will get an epic hero, Chinoru, who's fantastic for the Doom Tower, 200,000 silver, 1 XP boost, 1 energy refill, and 1 ancient shard so you can summon an awesome champion as soon as you get in-game. You'll find your rewards here in your inbox for the next 30 days only, so make sure to check it out and join me in the region of Teleria. Before we head out on our journey, Barry threatens to find us... what? 10 million dollars? Guys, my Patreon link is down below. Help me. Barry's mom says, He just can't sit still, that boy. I wonder who he takes after. I know who it is. He takes after my boy. Too bad we probably won't get to see him in BDSP. It's time to pick our starter, and unfortunately none of them ever get the dark type, so I'm just going to choose the one that evolves into my favorite fully evolved Gen 4 starter, Empoleon. Torterra is a close second, though. I nickname it Rito, and after leaving the lab, the professor gives us the return TM, which is funny because it inevitably sucks in the early game, so thanks, professor. With that, we get our Pokeballs from Dawn, and, well, here's one of the problems with Platinum. Technically, a Dark-type run would be impossible. There are no Dark-type encounters until, like, the third gym or later. For some reason, while you can get Murkrow and Stunky and Diamond, you can't get either of them in Platinum at all. So much for an enhanced version, huh? So what I've decided to do is actually make a modified version of Platinum so it's a truly enhanced version with those two encounters available in their regular Gen 4 location because I'm really curious to try a Dark Nuzlocke in Platinum specifically. Speaking of which, after battling these two trainers in Jubilife, they give us a potion. In Diamond and Pearl, you get the Hidden Power TM from them. I thought this was supposed to be an upgraded version! We arrive in Orberg, and the kid who's guiding us around describes Barry as sort of twitchy and impatient. Tell me why that is the perfect way to describe that mother Absolutely perfect. Now before we move on, I, uh, have some business to attend to. Just shut your eyes, this is going to be a slaughter. I have to. Our first encounter isn't available until Eterna Forest just after this gym, so, uh, yep, just let it happen. In Floroma Town, we can pick up some useful berries like Oran Berries, which are especially helpful early game, and one of the girls in the houses also gives us the Pluck TM, which I think is going to be very helpful very shortly. We arrive at the location of our first viable encounter, Eterna Forest, where we meet Cheryl and can find a Murkrow. 
Now these encounters are always both hilarious and nerve-wracking because we literally have to take out Cheryl's Chansey before it attempts to take out Murkrow with Egg Bomb. Thankfully, we pull it off and successfully catch Murkrow, which I nickname Ravali. Ravali ends up having a bold nature, which means plus defense and minus attack. Absolutely disgusting for a future Honchkrow, but we'll work with it. With that, we deposit good old Rito, which is good because if I'm honest, he was starting to scare me with his savagery. While making our way through the forest, Ravali levels up and learns Wing Attack for some more power than Peck. Now, in the forest is a mandatory double battle, and I was thinking we were golden, but remembered... Oh god, they have a Pachirisu. Not good. Thankfully, with the help of a Pursuit crit, which caused me to realize that Ravali has the Super Lock ability, which raises our crit chance. Amazing indeed. And the Pachirisu using Spark on Chansey instead of us on the first turn, we managed to scrape through under half health, meaning if it had hit us instead of Chansey, that would have been the end of the run. Wouldn't really have thought much of a random Eterna Forest battle, but man, that was a close one. We arrive in Eterna City next, the location of our next gym battle. Before that, we talk to this guy about the mysteries of the Sinnoh region, and he says the statue's inscription reads something like, Creation of Daya, Giver of Time, Birth of Pal, Creator of Parallel Dimensions. Wait, I think I figured it out. The answer to everything, it's Daya Pal. <laughs> Because we only have one Pokemon, we are very much getting close to the level cap, so it's time for the Eterna City Gym. Now this of course is a grass type gym, so with Rivali we're able to smash through the trainers with relative ease, although I was very worried about the level cap. Thankfully the last trainer brings us to level 22, so we made it just in time. It's time for gym leader Gardenia. Before her battle, I decide to replace Wing Attack with the Pluck TM we got for a particular reason. Now, Gardenia's team is interesting, and there are two big threats, the first being the fact that her Turtwig does have Reflect to lower our attack power for five turns. We hit it with Pluck down to the red, but unfortunately, it does get the Reflect off. She then uses a Super Potion, but our next Pluck gets a crit thanks to Super Luck to take it down since crits ignore stat changes and things like Reflect. Cherum comes out next, and we crit it as well for the one-hit KO. Incredible. I think I like Super Luck. Her final Pokemon is Roserade, and it outspeeds and immediately hits us with Stun Spore, but we break through and we don't get a crit on Pluck for less than half, but my plan works as Pluck strips it of its Citrus Berry. Magical Leaf then does about a third on us, Pluck brings her down to the red, and then she uses a Super Potion before we hit her down to the red again now that Reflect is gone. Another Magical Leaf brings us down to 25 HP and we're fully paralyzed on that turn and I'm like, uh oh. She hits us with a Magical Leaf again. We survive on just 7 HP but need to break through paralysis, and we do to take it down in the nick of time. Oh man, for a grass type gym with a flying type, that was way closer than I thought it would be, but Rafali pulled through. Now I'm getting a bit nervous about our next level cap, so I make sure to grab the experience share from the guy at the southern gate since we've seen enough Pokemon to get it, and I can give it to the Psyduck that we caught for HMs. Beside the Galactic building, we can pick up the Thief TM, which should be especially helpful for a dark type team. Inside the building, we're confronted by international police member Looker, who takes off his disguise in front of all the grunts in the front foyer. You idiot, what are you doing? He then puts his disguise right back on, and I'm like, uh, did none of you just see that? After making it to the top, we're challenged by Team Galactic Commander Jupiter. She leaves with a Zubat, which doesn't really have a way to hurt us substantially, so we can take it out in two plucks, taking minimal damage. Her final Pokemon is a Skuntank, which is normally quite terrifying, but here's the key. We can steal its Citrus Berry using Pluck to heal up to nearly full, and I think its programming is discouraged from hitting us with Night Slash since we resist it. So she uses Smoke Screen followed by a Mist Poison Gas, we bring it to the red, and then she hits us with Night Slash and gets a crit, but it doesn't do much at all since we resist, and we can KO it with one more attack. Man, Super Luck Murkrow is an absolute monster, perfectly designed for the early game. Do people know about this? While trying to get the bike, we're harassed by the champion of the region who is adamant that we take her Togepi egg. Cynthia, you know what we're doing here, right? A dark type run? Togetic is like the quintessential light side Pokemon. Get that thing away from me! You don't know the power of the dark side. Heading south through Route 206, I told myself to be careful since I know that all the trainers have electric types, and then I ran right into the first trainer not being able to control my bike properly. Ugh. Oh. Thankfully, we make it through the road safely and can go underneath it for quite a few crucial things, actually. This place is a goldmine for us. First, we can pick up the Poison Barb item to power up Poison-type moves, which is perfect for our next encounter, which we can find right here, a Stunky. 
This is a Pokemon that I've never really used in game before, so I'm excited for it since it technically is like an early root Pokemon, but with a very cool typing. We catch one and nickname it Zant, and Zant has a hardy neutral nature, so I'll take it. Now we're not quite done here. In Platinum, but not in Diamond and Pearl, the secret entrance to the Wayward Cave is open to us so we can find a hidden Dusk Stone right here. Incredible. I'm gonna wait to use it for a couple other level up moves on Murkrow, but amazing stuff regardless. Down here we can also find the Earthquake TM, which is crazy to be getting access to so early, not that any of our Pokémon can currently learn it. Down here, I also happen to run into a 1 in 8192 shiny Zubat out of nowhere. I've found two of these at the full odds rate before this one in Diamond and Soul Silver, so... Eh. Man, if only that was a Gibble instead, that would have been epic. Oh wait. In Mount Cornet, we encounter this strange blue-haired man who asked us if we wanted to party with him. Uh, sure, why not? On Route 209, we run into the Karate Guy who gives you the odd keystone. Now, Spiritomb is a dark type, however, in our previous Diamond Run, there was a lot of debate as to whether or not fulfilling the underground requirements to get it breaks our rules of not connecting to other games. Because of that, and because we've already used Spiritomb, and I want to try out some other encounters, I'm going to omit it here, but if you're a fan of it, I highly suggest you watch that run if you haven't, as it was pretty cool too. With that, we arrive in Hard Home, where we'll be taking on our next gym. Beforehand, I grab the Shell Bell from this girl in one of the apartments, and I also teach our Thief TM to Zant since it has no other dark type moves at the moment. Hard Home also grants us another encounter as Bebe? Bebe? The creator of the PC system gives us a gift, an Eevee, which I catch and nickname Ganon. May not seem fitting, but Eevee has many different forms it can become, so yeah. It has a relaxed nature, plus defense and minus speed, which isn't terrible for a future Umbreon. Since Eevee isn't a dark type, we won't be able to use it until it evolves, but I can give it the experience share and make sure we're increasing its friendship in the meantime. The Heart Home Gym is a ghost type gym, a gym that we very much have a type advantage against. The trainers are all fantastic training for Zant now that he can use Thief, and in no time we arrive at the gym leader, Fantina. Normally, Fantina is a disaster for us, but I'm feeling pretty confident about this one. She leads with a Duskull, and I lead with Zant. I'm scared she might try to burn us with Will-O-Wisp, which is why I left Revali in the back, but strangely enough, it only hits us with Pursuit, followed by Shadow Sneak, so two thief attacks take her down. In comes her Miss Magius next, and this thing is always terrifying, although thankfully in Platinum, it doesn't have Thunderbolt, which means switching is an option. However, I want to do some damage on it, so I stay in and get Confused by Confuse Ray before hitting it with Thief. It then hits us with Shadow Ball for about half, even though it's resisted, then our second thief just barely doesn't take it down before its Citrus Berry activates. Knowing we might get KO'd, I switch into Revali, who tanks it with about two-thirds, gets hit again down to 24 HP, but then Assurance is able to take it down. Whew. She still has one Pokemon remaining though, a Haunter. There's nothing I can do here, so I go for Assurance, and surprisingly we outspeed, but we don't get a crit, it barely survives on like one HP, it goes for Shadow Claw, and thankfully, it doesn't get a crit, although it seems we would have survived one anyway. She then uses a Super Potion, and one more attack is able to take it down since it didn't quite heal the full. Amazing stuff, but way closer than I expected. Three badges. In the Route 209 gate, Barry challenges us to battle, and this is an interesting one because he leads with Staravia with Intimidate, so we're kinda screwed either way. I lead with Stunky and just go for Poison Gas since I know this thing tends to spam double teams, so at least we have some guaranteed damage. We then miss a Screech and get hit by Wing Attack to a bit above half, and then we miss again. Oh. From here, we get hit by Wing Attack down to 14 HP before our berry, and then I hit it with Slash, hoping we can get a crit through the Intimidate, but we don't before Poison brings it really low. I'm forced to switch now, and Rivali tanks Wing Attack with above half before outspeeding and taking it down. From there, we take down Buizel in two blocks after our Orenberry helps us get above half after a Water Gun. Now here, I was feeling good because I looked at the wrong team setup for him. I was expecting him to have Rosalia, not Ponyta, so we get hit to 26 HP before taking it down in two hits instead of one. His final Pokemon is his now evolved Grottle, and Pluck does less than half, Razor Leaf brings us to just 10 HP, and now I have no choice. I go for Pluck and just hope for the Super Luck activation, and we get it. Oh my god. We were so damn close to getting over half damage, so if we had lost out on that, I would have lost my mind. After that battle, I realize we need to evolve Eevee as soon as possible, so I give it the Soothe Bell, which you can get in Eterna Forest only in Platinum. We also crawl all the way up the tower on Route 209 to save the elderly. Have no fear, ladies. And I forgot they only give you garbage items, not the Strength HM like in Diamond and Pearl. Whoops. On Route 210, we can pick up a fantastic TM for Revali, Roost for some recovery. 
We also get the payback TM from this karate dude, which basically doubles in power if the user moves after the opponent. Could be useful. We then arrive in Veilstone City, where the next gym is. This kid in the Veilstone department store says, I'm gonna give an HP up to my cr- Did you just say, cr cricket tot? After that traumatic experience, I make sure to pick up the Protect TM here since I think it will be very useful later on. I also make sure to get Ganon a massage before heading to the Veilstone Gym. While taking out some fighting types, Rivali finally gets to level 31 where he learns Taunt. That's what I was waiting for, so now we can finally use the Dust Stone to evolve him into a beastly Honchcrow. A Pokemon I don't think I've really used in game before, so that's awesome. Zant also learns Night Slash along the way, which is great, although perhaps not the greatest for this gym. I also decide to teach the Roost TM to Rivali, thinking it might be useful for the Gym Leader. Speaking of which, it's time for the Fighting-type Gym Leader, Maylene. Now normally this would be petrifying for a Dark-type team, but Honchkrow's Flying-type definitely saves us in this regard. Maylene starts the battle with a Metatite as I lead Rivali. Flock is an immediate outspeed and KO without a crit even. Incredible. She next sends out Machoke, and Pluck does quite a lot on it, but then it hits us with super effective Rock Tomb for a third, and which drops our speed. Since I know we'd survive, I actually decide to go for Roost here, and it used Focus Energy, so now we can just take it down with Pluck with full health. Nice. Her final Pokemon is Lucario, which is actually not weak to flying, and it outspeeds and hits us with Force Palm to a bit above half, 69 HP in fact. Nice. Before Pluck then does less than half. It then uses Drain Punch on us to low health and gets a ton of recovery before Pluck brings it to about a third. Now we are very low, even with the Shell Bell, but I know if we switch in Zant, he'll get outsped and hit twice in a row, which he cannot survive. Drain Punch did 40 HP damage on us, and we had 39 HP left too. I was kicking myself, but just hoped for a low roll and went for it, and it ended up using Metal Claw instead. We survive on just 3 HP and can then KO it with one final attack. Unbelievable. Rivali is a god. Realizing how desperate our situation is, I get Ganon another massage, man oh man he's spoiled, and at nighttime I level him up and he's finally friendly enough to evolve into a beautiful Umbreon which should help us a lot defensively. Now that Route 214 south of Veilstone is available to us and it's nighttime, we can actually get our fourth encounter here, a Houndour, which is awesome for its fire typing and special attacking presence. We catch one and nickname it Dimitri and it ends up having a bashful neutral nature which I'm fine with. After picking up the Aerial Ice TM along the way, I grind up our Pokemon before the next gym, during which Dimitri evolves into a beastly Houndoom, and Xan also ends up evolving into a Skun Tank, which I'm quite excited about too. On Route 212, we can also pick up the crucially important Toxic TM before making our way back to Pastoria, where Barry decides to challenge us just feet away from the gym. Thankfully, now that Zant has evolved and learned Flamethrower, we can lead with him and essentially be unaffected by Intimidate against Staravia and take it down in two attacks. For Ponyta, I then switch Dimitrian to absorb any potential fire moves, and Bite takes it down in two attacks as it just used Tail Whip twice. Buizel then comes in next, and I switch in Rivali as we get hit by Pursuit, then Pluck is able to one-hit KO it and is a two-hit KO on Grottle afterwards. Those evolutions and new encounters certainly helped us. The Pastoria Gym is a Water-type gym, which is of course neutral against us except for Houndoom, and Zant with Night Slash had some great damage output against the trainers. Before the gym leader, I decide to use our Toxic TM on Umbreon, who's able to use it infamously well in competitive. It's time for the fifth gym leader, Wake, the WWE Madman. He leads with Gyarados, and I know everything we have is a bad matchup against its Intimidate, so I lead with Ganon to get hit by Waterfall before landing a Toxic on it. From there, I then get hit again to below half before our Citrus Berry activates, and then I use Growl to lower its attack. Now that we have better survivability, I use Confuse Ray on top of that to try and render this thing much less of a threat. A crit could take us out though, so I switch into Zant as Gyarados hits itself in Confusion. It turns out we actually outspeed, so I can then take it down with a Night Slash from there. In comes Quagsire next, and I go for Night Slash before it hits us with super effective Stab Mudshot and lowers our accuracy. Knowing he'll probably use Mudshot again, I switch into Revali to predict it, and it works and we get a free switch. From here, I hit it with Pluck, it misses Rock Tomb, and another is able to take it down. In comes his final Pokemon, and a huge threat for our team, Floatzel, which has Ice Fang. I can't really switch though, so I stay in and get hit below half, and then activate my plan by hitting it with a Pluck, which takes its Citrus Berry from it so we get recovery from it and our Shell Bell. Now, I was hoping this would be enough to survive another Ice Fang, and it was as we live with just 11 HP, hit it with Pluck again, but it survives in the red on just a sliver. Oh no, that I did not account for. 
here. I know Wake will heal up though, so I stay in and go for Pluck again, hoping for a higher roll or something, and we get a crit, but it brings him down to the same health. Now I know we can't stay in, but Umbreon's weak, Houndoom would get destroyed, so I'm forced to switch into Zant and hope he can survive since his berry still hasn't activated. We get hit by Brine, I was really hoping for Aqua Jet there, and our Citrus Berry brings us just below half, literally 1 HP below, which means Brine would now be double power. There is nothing I can do though, so Zant is taken down by a super powered Brine. Ouch, 1 HP off. That really hurts. Thanks to Zant's sacrifice, we can now get a free switch into Umbreon, who handles a Brine with just 18 HP and can respond with a faint attack to take that damn thing down. Fifth badge, but it came at a cost. After Barry repeatedly calls Wake Master and proceeds to be an absolute f**kwad, we begin talking outside of the Great Marsh and... No, no, no! That was supposed to be our next encounter location! Thankfully, parts of the Great Marsh remain unscathed, and we can search for our next encounter, which I didn't pursue until now because it doesn't evolve until this new level cap anyway. A Scoropy, which only appears here on certain days, in certain sections, and is a 10% chance, but amazingly enough, I found it pretty quickly in the first section. We also successfully catch it, which is no guarantee in Safari Zone kind of places, and I nickname it Moldorok. Moldorok has a relaxed nature, plus defense and minus speed. Minus speed isn't great, but might be good for payback at least. Before heading to Celestic Town, I decided to teach Revali the Fly HM for a bit more power, not that a Haunch Crow will be useful for the next three gyms in the slightest. On the next route, I actually employ a funny strat, using Ganon who has Faint Attack which can't miss, and since I didn't use Defog, this essentially just lowers all the opposing trainer's accuracy while ours is unaffected. In Celestic Town, we can pick up the Wise Glasses from this legend, who will also give us other useful items at different times of the day, so we'll have to remember to come back here. In the Celestic Ruins, Cyrus gets angry about Cynthia's grandma and I dating, and challenges me for the right to date her as well. He leads with a Sneasel, who Dimitri is able to take down in a few Fire Fangs after we get hit by Night Slash. His Murkrow then gets hit with two Fire Fangs after its Citrus Berry activates, and then, whoa! Tropec did a lot more than I thought before we could take it down with just 15 HP remaining. Golbat is then handled by a combination of Ravali, who got absolutely wrecked by misses combined with Confusion before Ganon could be switched in to save the day. For winning, we not only get to keep Cynthia's grandma, but she also gives us the Surf HM. Now that we have Surf, we can make it to the Fuego Ironworks, a rather hidden area, wherein we can grab the Flamethrower TM to teach to Dimitri, since it will be very useful to have it early before he actually learns it via level up past the next couple of level caps. With that, we arrive in Cantilave City, and Barry's battle on the bridge was quite manageable now that we have the Wise Glasses and Flamethrower Dimitri since his Intimidate strat doesn't affect us. I switched into Revali to handle his Float Soul, and then back into Dimitri for his Rapidash, which was handled with Faint Attack, so that we could then outspeed and take down his Heracross, which otherwise would have been a massive threat with close combat. His Torterra did massive damage on Ganon too with a Razor Leaf to the red, but ultimately succumbed to Toxic. After getting the Strength HM from Riley and doing some training on Iron Island, it's time for the Candlelight Gym. This gym is a Steel Type 1, so Dimitri is able to put in some serious work against the trainers. During the process, Moldorok evolves at level 40 into a Beastly Drapion, a really cool Dark Type in my opinion. Now that he can learn it, I teach him the Earthquake TM, which should be quite powerful indeed. The 6th gym leader is Byron, and I have a bit of a plan for this battle. He leads with a Magneton, and I lead with Dimitri. Drapion with Earthquake would have been great too, but I wanted to ensure the outspeed, which works as Flamethrower is a one-hit KO. In comes his Steelix next, which is also a one-hit with its terrible special defenses. His final Pokemon is a Bastiodon, which wouldn't get taken down by one Flamethrower, and which would destroy Dimitri with Stone Edge, so I switch into Moldorok, who has really high defense, but still takes just about half damage. Oh. Four times super effective Earthquake brings it to about a third, but its Citrus Berry heals it above half before he uses Iron Defense. Uh-oh. I have no other choice though, so I go for Earthquake again to bring him low, and then he uses Metal Burst out of nowhere, and we survive on just 7 HP before our Citrus Berry, and then can take him down with one more to win the battle. Wow, that was close. In the Candlelave Library, we're trying to study quietly for our next exam, and... Oh god! What's with all these damn explosions everywhere? Lake Valor is up next, which Team Galactic has blown up, so we need to beat Commander Saturn into the ground. His Golbat is handled by Dimitri with a couple flamethrowers, although we did get toxic in the process. He then sends out a Toxicroak, which is a massive threat for us, but a switch into Revali allows us to barely survive two attacks on just 10 HP before we can one-hit KO it with Fly. That thing could have potentially swept our entire team. 
His Bronzor is then an easy switch back into Dimitri for the win. At Lake Verity, we have to take on some more galactic goofballs, and like the elite vgc -er I am... Okay, I'm totally not. I came up with a great strategy where we could send out Moldorok and Revali so we could just Earthquake everything, getting damage on all Pokémon except for Revali with his Flying type. Amazing. Commander Mars is our final galactic battle for now, and she's always quite scary, but I have a bit of a plan. I send out Moldorok first against her Golbat, but it gets a crit right away on us to nearly half, we hit it with payback to below half, and then we can take it out with another after being brought quite low ourselves. In comes Bronzor next, so I switch in Dimitri for the Flamethrower KO. However, this brings in Perugly next, and unfortunately it does have the Thick Fat ability, so fire moves aren't as effective on it. I'm forced to switch, so I go into Ganon while I knew it would just use Fake Out. However, it immediately outspeeds and puts us to sleep with Hypnosis. Thankfully, we wake up in a couple turns and can use Growl, then after being brought to half with Slash, I hit it with Confuse Ray, but then it just puts us to sleep yet again. Eventually, we're brought too low, so I have to switch into Revali. Now, what I was worried about was a crit from Slash, since that would cancel out the Growl we got off, and at half health, I'm able to hit it with Fly to below half, but its Citrus Berry activates. Now, I thought two flies would do enough despite its berry, but it turns out I should have used Pluck instead as it barely survives on a sliver. Not good. She then hits another Hypnosis somehow that puts us to sleep, hits us with another Slash, and we survive in the red. I decide I have to switch into Dimitri here, and thankfully we don't get crit on two Slashes in a row so we can take it out. On the way to Snowpoint City, we find a Soft Sand item to boost ground moves, and also the Never Melt Ice to boost ice moves, which should be fantastic for our next encounter, which occurs right nearby on Route 216, a Sneasel. We catch one and nickname it Twily, and it has a Brave Nature, plus attack, and minus speed. Plus attack is great, but minus speed is terrible, so I guess it balances out. Further on the route, we encounter Maylene, who is barefoot in the snow, and as soon as we talk to her, this massive snowstorm begins. Did you summon this Hail Hellstorm? DEMON! Just before Snowpoint, we... wait a minute, Barry? You used Rock Climb to get up there, so how'd you get the badge already? We just left! Oh, you son of a... We arrive at Snowpoint City, the location of our next gym battle, and... Oh, hey, look! There's the demon again. Stay away from me. Speaking of demons... The seventh gym leader is Candace, the Ice-type trainer. Now, I'm sure you can all imagine my strategy for this battle. I got us up to the level cap, sent out Dimitri first with the Wise Glasses attached for extra power, and Flamethrower is able to outspeed and one-hit KO every Pokémon on her team in rapid succession, to win us our seventh badge. Dimitri is a monster, what can I say? Before we head to the Veilstone Galactic Headquarters, we have a few power-ups we can do for our team. First, I fly to Orberg City so that I can go back to the Orberg Gate, where, now that we have Strength, we can access the Brick Break TM, which should be amazing for Sneasel. Oh, we also find out the true answers to the mysteries of the universe. It turns out we might have been wrong after all. I also teach Moldorok the Rock Slide TM and give it the Rock Incense for our upcoming battle, in addition to heading to Route 212 where we can use the Shard Move Tutor to teach Twily the Ice Punch move, since its best ice move by level up is Ice Shard for some reason, and also use the Poison Jab TM on Moldorok for a better Poison Stab move. With that, it's time for Cyrus. Now, after all those preparations, it turns out our unevolved Sneasel with the Never Melt Ice is able to sweep through his entire team with Ice Punch, and Drapion wasn't even necessary with all the setup that we did for him to take on flying types. Interesting. I was not really expecting that, but I'll take it. <clears throat> Your leader is psychotic. Everyone follow me instead. I'm slightly less psychotic. What? It's a good selling point, no? Now something that's really cool is Cyrus's office holds something that might be the key to this run. A hidden item on the floor, the Razor Claw, which allows Sneasel to evolve if you level it up while holding one. Thanks, evil villain bent on destroying the universe. At the peak of Mount Coronet comes the only place where you can find our final encounter, an Absol, which is a 5% chance to find, so it took a while. We'll have to check its nature and whatnot later since we needed an HM Pokemon to get up here, which makes the next few battles especially difficult. First up, we have a double battle with Barry against Mars and Jupiter. This battle is interesting, and basically my strategy consists of not allowing both their Skuntank and Perugly to be on the field at the same time, but Barry can be unpredictable and can mess that up quite easily. Dimitri makes quick work of one of the Bronzors though, and we can then just do over half damage on Skuntank, but his Barry helps it and hits us hard with Poison Jab to a third before their other Bronzor uses Light Screen. From here, I decide to switch into Moldorok to resist the Poison Jab and to not be able to be hit by almost anything from the Bronzor, and I start using Earthquake despite Barry's Pokémon, since I'd like to get his Intimidate Staraptor out on the field anyway. 
Unfortunately, he brings his stupid Rapid Ash out next, but we're able to take Skuntank down as Barry just barely doesn't take down the other Bronzor, which is actually a good thing. Eventually, with Rock Slide, we took down their Bronzor and Golbat, leading Perugly as the only thing on the field. Amazingly, Barry's Heracross survived a four times super effective Aerial Ace and then took Perugly down with close combat. Unreal. Before their Golbat could then be taken down in a couple attacks. Not bad. Before we head to the Distortion World, Sneasel finally evolved into a Weavile, which I imagine is going to be a great help, especially against Cyrus's team. When we get to the Distortion World, Cynthia's like, there are no Pokemon down here. <laughs> you're wrong about that one. After reaching Cyrus, he challenges us to battle, and he leaves with a Houndoom as I send out Moldorok. Amazingly, he missed his attempt to burn us, so Soft Sand Boosted Earthquake is an instant one-hit KO. He sends out Gyarados with Intimidate next, so I switch into Ganon, who we used against Wake's Gyarados, and employ the same kind of strategy with Toxic and Growl before switching back into Moldrock, whose high defense and the Growl allow us to take it down with a couple Rock Slides, although it did hit us with Super Effective Earthquake pretty low. Hunchcrow then comes in, and now's the time for Twily, although somehow he predicted our switch and went for Heat Wave of all things, but thankfully not a crit, and we survive on low health before taking it down with Ice Punch. He then sends out Weavile, which I know will outspeed our minus speed variant, so I switch into Houndoom knowing the best he's got is x Scissor against him. The first hit brings us to just above half and I was nervous, but the second brings us to 9 HP before we could one hit KO it with Flamethrower. Damn, that was close. His final Pokemon is Crobat, and Revali is the only thing we have that's not crazy low health, but he hits his heart with Cross Poison twice and poisons us before we hit it to about a quarter and we get some Shell Bell recovery. Everything on our team is incredibly low health and I have no idea what to do. Eventually I realize our only option is to sack Revali. It won't be very useful for the next gym anyway, to be honest, so I just click Roost, and the Crobat misses its Air Slash, so we can take it down with a nice Slash. Revali is just straight up a miracle worker. I could not believe this. After Twily punches Giratina, the god of the underworld, square in the mouth, I go to take out Absol out of the PC, and it turns out to have a jolly nature, plus speed and minus special attack, which is ideal. Finally, we get a great nature. With that, we arrive in Sunny Shore and are ready to take on the final gym leader, Volkner, an electric trainer. I had a great strategy for him, as his lead Jolteon has Thunder Wave, so I attached a Cherry Berry on Moldorok, but he doesn't use it and instead hits us with Charge Beam before our Earthquake is just barely not able to take him out. Oops. I guess Soft Sand would have been better after all. He also got the special attack raise from Charge Beam, so the next one after his Hyper Potion hits us to about a third before we KO him. Alright, a disastrous start and my plan is foiled. Thankfully his Raichu misses Focus Blast as I knew nothing could switch into two attacks from that thing and Earthquake is a one hit KO. In comes his Electivire next and I thought at this health we could survive any physical attack from him and we do at just 6 HP but Earthquake does not KO and he gets Berry Recovery. Here I'm forced to switch so I send in Ganon and thankfully as I thought he just went for Quick Attack but we even survived Thunder Punch well so Faint Attack is able to take him down. His final Pokemon is Luxray, and with the help of a couple Growls from Ganon, I'm able to switch safely into Dimitri, who can take him down in a few Flamethrowers for our 8th and final badge. After a long trek through Victory Row, we arrive at our final challenge, the Pokemon League. I do a ton of preparation fulfilling our AVs, getting the Dark Pulse TM for Houndoom, and teaching Night Slash to Weavile via the Move Tutor. We do have our final rival battle against Barry at the entrance, but I made sure to get near the Elite Four level cap before challenging him, so he's quite a manageable challenge with Dimitri sweeping through Staraptor with Flamethrower, even Floatzel with Dark Pulse, Heracross with Flamethrower, and then for Torterra, I switched in Twily for the 4 times super effective Ice Punch, switched in Moldorok to take care of Rapidash with Earthquake, and then paralyzed his Snorlax using Ganon's Synchronize ability against his own Body Slam, then switched into Nehru to overpower him with Swords Dance and Night Slash, although we had some close paralysis calls for sure. It's time for the League. The first Elite Four member is Eren, the Bug-type trainer. I made sure to go back to the Glasses Guy in Celestic Town to grab the Choice Specs, so Dimitri is able to one-hit KO every single member of his team with Choice Specs boosted, stabbed, super effective Flamethrower, except his Drapion which survived on like 1 HP, but could only do half damage before we KO'd it. Not a bad start. The second Elite Four member is one I was really worried about, Bertha, a Ground-type trainer, and we have like no super effectiveness besides Weavile, but all of her Pokémon have Rock moves, so that's a no-go. I spent a lot of time theorycrafting for this battle and came up with what I thought was the best strategy. Let's give it a try. She leads with Whiskash, and I lead with Ganon, who I use the Protect TM on in place of Confuse Ray. 
My plan here was to basically just toxic stall the Whiskash, and since we had leftovers on, we were able to negate the Sandstorm damage and stall out the Sandstorm too. However, we brought it right to the red before Bertha used a full restore, but I predicted it and used Toxic to get her again, and over time, we're able to take it down with pretty good health, although the Sandstorm was reactivated. In comes what I'm most scared of, her Rhyperior, which has super effective moves against our entire team. Now, I thought that it would go for Megahorn, which is why I led with Ganon so I could use Growl first, but she goes for Avalanche. Why in the world would the AI do that? I'm not complaining though, as now I hit it with Toxic, and then it went for Megahorn, but missed, then I Protect stalled it and used Growl again before it hit us with Megahorn, but now it's not doing too much damage, so I can stall it out with 73 HP remaining. In comes Gliscor next, and it has a whole bunch of type coverage moves in this game, but I switch in Twily nonetheless, and it went for Earthquake to take us below half before we could KO it with 4 times super effective Stab, Never Melt Ice Boosted, Ice Punch. Golem then comes out next, which has way too high defense, so I switch in Moldrock, predicting the Fire Punch, which it was, however, she gets the burn. Oh no. I stay in, knowing I need to get damage off, and Earthquake hardly does anything before it brings us to 11 HP after burn damage. Thankfully, our Black Sludge saved us. Here, I make the risky decision to switch in Revali, and she didn't go for Earthquake this time. What the actual f***? And then we barely don't KO on a sliver before she full restores. Man oh man. We get a crit on our next Night Slash though, and then she uses Thunder Punch to bring us to the red, and gets the Paralysis, so now I can't stay in. The luck in this battle, I swear. I'm forced to switch into Ganon now, who's thankfully bulky enough to tank an attack even at low health and take it out. Her final Pokemon is Hippowdon, perhaps the scariest of all, with almost all our Pokemon weak, and it starts the Sandstorm. With only two Protects left, I use one at the start to try and stall the weather out, and then I use Growl, but it uses Yawn. Hmm. I use Growl again, knowing I need to lower its attack as much as possible, and it hits us with Earthquake, but we're able to survive in the red after Sandstorm, but we fall asleep. With its attack now lowered, I can switch into Nehru, and she uses Stone Edge, but gets a crit down to 13 HP. What the f*** is going on? I send in Dimitri, who immediately gets rocked by Earthquake. Everything we have is in the red. I have no choice but to just try and get big damage. I go for Dark Pulse, it brings it to a third, and finally the luck turns in our favor as it flinches, allowing us to finally take it down and end this hellish battle. No words, just no words. The third Elite Four member is Flint, the Fire Trainer. Realizing how much trouble we've already had, I decide to use the last of our rare candies on our party. He starts with Houndoom, and I lead with Moldorok with the Metronome item attached from the Veilstone game corner, going for Earthquake, which is going to raise in power each turn we use it consecutively, and it takes down Houndoom immediately. He then sends out Infernape, which hits us with Earthquake for a bit less than half, but our Earthquake somehow doesn't KO, and he then uses a full restore, but the next one takes it to just a sliver as well. It then uses Flare Blitz out of nowhere, and we survived on just 2 HP before he goes down to recoil. Holy... Next is his Flareon, and here I switched into Twily, figuring we could bait the quick attack, and we did, so I can go for a Soft Sand Boosted Dig to take it down. Was definitely worth the TM, as now I can do the same to Rapidash and his Magmortar too. Whew. The last Elite Four member is the Psychic-type trainer, Lucian, and although we have a Dark-type team, he has some tricks up his sleeve, so we've gotta be careful. He leads with Mr. Mime, and I lead with Twily. I cannot allow him to set up Reflect, so I'm going full power with Dreadplate Boosted Night Slash for the KO. He then sends out Gallade, which we can't one-hit KO, and of course has fighting moves, so I switch into Moldorok, and he went for Stone Edge for about a third. I hit him with Poison Jab just to get some damage, and it does right above half before he hits us with another Stone Edge. Thankfully, our next hit does just enough to KO. His Bronzong comes out next, and thinking he'll go for Earthquake, I send out Revali, and then I switch into Houndoom knowing he won't Earthquake a Flying type, and the plan works as he just goes for Calm Mind, and Choice Specs Boosted Flamethrower still does enough to KO him. He sends out Alakazam next, which does have Focus Blast, so I switch in Revali, Focus Blast misses, and then he hits us with one on the next turn for over half, and then Nice Slash gets the job done. Man, that miss was actually needed, it seems. His final Pokemon is Espeon, which is also a one-hit with Night Slash. It's time for the champion. The Sinnoh champion is, of course, none other than Cynthia, and her team is always terrifying, but I'm out for revenge. Her lead, Spiritomb, looks like a near-impossible threat with no weaknesses and Silverwind, but I led with Revali, who I noticed none of her moves can really do that much on, and fly as a two-hit KO, although we missed one and got brought to half. 
Saving the day as always. Rivali beats out Togekiss, which has Shockwave, so I switch in Moldorok, but she went for Air Slash instead, which did over half, but we have the Black Sludge to bring us just over again, so I can go for Rock Slide before we get hit to just 6 HP before recovery. Here, I switch into Twily, and she went for Water Pulse, so now I can respond with Ice Punch for the KO. Lucario comes out next, and my calcs tell me I won't KO with Dig, and everything else would get rocked by Aura Sphere, so I'm forced to sack Moldorok. Rest in peace, King. Now I can switch in Dimitri for the Outspeed and Flamethrower KO. This baits out Milotic now, and I swap into Ganon, who I had been conserving purposefully since he's our only way to handle this thing, being able to Toxic stall it into Oblivion, although it brought us all the way down to 23 HP before recovery. In comes the monster Garchomp, and there's obviously nothing we can switch in, so it's time to let Ganon go. Twily then comes out, and being one of the few things that could outspeed Garchomp, absolutely rocks it with a 4 times super effective stab, never melt ice boosted ice punch. Damn, that feels good. Her final Pokemon is a mere Roserade, the one that, if you guys have seen our other Gen 4 runs, you know has been an absolute pain beyond imagination, so ice punching this thing square in the mouth is the best feeling I've ever had. We've done it. With that, we've beaten a Platinum Hardcore Nuzlocke with only Dark Types, and what a fun run it was. Dark Types are definitely much better than they were in Gen 3, and deservedly so. If you enjoyed the run, please don't forget to hit that subscribe button as it really does help a lot and grows our community. A huge thanks to my YouTube members and patrons who make these videos possible. If you'd like to support and get your name up here, the links are also down below. If you enjoyed, drop a like down below to help the video out and leave a comment letting me know what kind of run we should do next and I'll see you guys for our next challenge video.